I've been told that I'm easily amused. Perhaps, but cruising aboard the hybrid cargo slash passenger ship, the Aranui, to the Marquesas Islands in the South Pacific is no idle pursuit. Even the most cynical travel-hardened pro can't help but be awed by the sights, sounds, and taste of French Polynesia. It took several days traveling before the shackles of stress and modern life finally loosened their vice-like grip. If you've never been on an extended journey for several days, chances are you don't know what it feels like to truly relax. The feeling is nothing short of life-altering, and I cannot recommend it enough. Mix in the exotic flavors of the Marquesas, and you've got the perfect recipe for not wanting a trip to end. But alas, I've learned that for every hello, there is a goodbye. It was time to bid adieu to the Marquesas, but not before visiting the final two islands. Come with us and say hello to some of the friendliest humans on our planet as we prepare to say goodbye to the Marquesas. We've been visiting the exotic and remote Marquesas Islands for several days, and we had some incredible experiences that will likely last a lifetime. Each island had its own unique flavor, as well as its own docking protocol for the talented crew of the Aranui. But none so risky and impressive a maneuver as when we pulled into the invisible bay off the island of Oahuca. Don't try this at home. All right, guys, we're up early, around 5.30 in the morning, supposedly the ship, the bay is really small, so the ship has to turn sideways and sort of parallel park. And uh, theoretically, you're able to jump from the boat to the rock back to the boat. Uh, I'm not going to do that. The seamen are the ones who are going to do that. But uh, let's see. It should be, uh, I hope it's worth getting up early. I know the sunrise uh, is pretty, pretty amazing. The island of Uahuka is extraordinarily remote, rural, and gorgeous. Yes, I know I keep saying that about all the islands, but it keeps being true. What do you want me to say? Ronnie, my friend, fixer, and guide for this entire journey, wanted to show me around, beginning with Uahuka's claim to fame, wood carving. Their specialty is wood carving. And so this small museum um, has, you know, beautiful artifacts from um, the old days, uh -huh. also some more modern art. Wow, look at this guy. Um, yeah, this is one of the specialty in Oahuka, and it was found here. Wow. Um, this kind of tiki with an, you know, elephant Snow. head. Yeah, oh, an elephant um. head, okay. <laughs> or an insect, or uh -huh. a fly. Maybe, we don't know. <laughs> wow, so intricate, amazing, amazing. And then even the canoes, obviously. The canoes with the tapa sails. Right. Um, here, you know, you have the replica of our what a house would have been in the past. So they would like stand up here and what? Mm -hmm. Try to hit each other and knock And try to other. knock, yeah, one another like down. Wow. <laughs> um, head breakers. You know. Head breakers. I don't think I have to ask what that's for. <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory, right? I know, I know. If I say the phrase rural and remote one more time, you're going to use a head breaker on me, right? And if you are thinking about getting a nice piece of uh, wood carving, you know, to bring back, this right. would be the place. This is the island. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uahuka is not only rural and remote. Ouch! Sorry. Okay, okay. Uahuka is not only known for wood carving. There are wild horses that dot the island, and they far outnumber the people. So these horses are wild, right? Yeah, they're beautiful. And they're all over the island? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. More horses than inhabitants. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like several thousand, right? Uh -huh. Not just like a few hundred, several thousand. That's amazing. They're so beautiful. You know, they don't look like malnutrition or anything, so they must mm -hmm. be thriving. Do you ride horses? Um, once in a while. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Would you ride those if I caught one? Let's try. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't catch a horse, but we did catch a delicious local pastry with a name suspiciously similar to pie. You call this a, a what? A bay? A pay. A pay. <laughs> okay, a pay. That's easy. Uh, it looks like a fruit pie. Yeah, it is, um, you know, made with uh, banana or coconut or pineapple, whatever you want to use inside. Mm. Um, so, you know, as a, for breakfast or for a snack. 
There we go. Let's do it for a snack. Obviously, like fat. Free. What are you gonna do? Fat free? Snack. Mmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's good. So that one is um banana. Oh, this is banana. Mm hmm Mmm. That crust is awesome. Daring nautical maneuvers, incredible beauty, intricate wood carvings, wild horses, and freakishly good pastries. I was supremely chill and not missing home in the least. When the Ara Nui hits the shores of an isolated island like Uahuka in the Marquesas, it's kind of a festive deal. And while the people of French Polynesia want for little, it's always a good move to show your appreciation with gifts, be it monetary, or better yet, packing a little something extra for the local kids. I like Frisbees because they're easy to pack and it affords me quality time with the local young whippersnappers. Plus, I've been told I'm really, really good. Uahuka is so remote and rural, sorry again, that when Ronnie took me to the botanical garden, we had free reign of the place. Other than the camera crew, whom I couldn't seem to shake, there was not another human being in sight. It felt just like the Garden of Eden. Sans a talking snake in the damnation of humankind, of course. It feels like we're in Eden. All these fruits yeah. and flowers. You'd never starve here. But this is, a, uh, I believe, a star fruit? It I'm is correct. a star fruit. Can I pick it? Can sure. Pick it? Let me pick this one right here. They're very nice and fresh. Ooh, look at that. Can you eat them raw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can? I'm going to try. Oh, my goodness. Mmm. Mmm. That's delicious. Mmm. So juicy. <laughs> and it's all uh, Ooh, that's good. natural, no, you know, chemicals no, uh, or any products. No chemicals, no nothing mm -hmm. like that. That's awesome. Chemical free fruit? My taste buds were like, whoa, never tasted that before. Mmm. I'll see what other goodies away. I think I know this fruit. This is a uh, mango, yeah? Yes. Look how beautiful they are. I love mangoes. This mangoes really, here are so good. They're so good. They're mm -hmm. so sweet because they're so ripe. Mm -hmm. By the time I get them, uh, like in New York City, they're like kind of hard, and <laughs> you can tell they were picked basically like that, and mm -hmm. then ripen on yeah. the journey over. But when you come somewhere where they're actually ripe, they just taste so sweet, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Bread and fruit may not sound like a balanced meal, but actual breadfruit may be the single most important all-around main food item in French Polynesia. Sorry, truth hurts, you crazy coconuts. Breadfruit, I've heard, was like a staple for you guys, right? Yes, so breadfruit is used, um, you know, as a replacement for bread or for uh, potatoes. Okay. Um, so it grows on beautiful trees. So it's very versatile. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is the point of breadfruit. And I had heard even back in the days when indigenous people were here, uh, what they would do is they figured out a way to store it, keep it, because mm -hmm. there were some years that it wouldn't grow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so it, that held them over. So breadfruit really kept them alive. Yes. Tahitian vanilla is famous, but just like a certain D list celebrity, they too are so high maintenance. Not that I know anything about that, of course. So this is um, Tahitian vanilla. You can see it's um, it's a vine and it's um, it's part of the orchid plants. So it's really a you know huge deal for French Polynesia and Tahitian vanilla is considered one of the best and the most fragrant in the world. Mm -hmm. So in French Polynesia, the insect that pollinates the flowers does not exist. So basically every flower, every orchid has to be pollinated by hand. Right. And to avoid that there's too much moist in the vanilla pot, right. they'll massage them oh. daily until they get to like the perfect dry stage. Oh. Wow, <laughs> so they've been really pampered, eh? Yes, they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. Maybe in my next life I'll come back with your vanilla I pot know, and massage get pampered. Every day. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so nice. One of the first things I noticed in French Polynesia was the preponderance of tattoos on locals. But these aren't whimsical tats from a regrettable night out. Here, tattoos have cultural history, carry deep meaning, and are taken very seriously. Back on board the Aranui and route to our next island, it was time to talk tattoos with Taiki. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the significance of the tattoos in Marquesian and all of Tahiti, really, but it really began in the Marquesas, yeah? 
Yeah, so in the past, uh, they used uh, the traditional tattoo for the tribal uh, war. Okay, huh? okay. So they have a deep meaning about that. Right. And it's about tapu. The tapu, it means the secret, huh? The secret, okay. The secret is, uh, for example, when they tattoo the, the hands, right. it means all things they will touch, it's sacred, it's ah. tapu. It looks like a protection. Ah. You know? okay. Something okay. to protect, yeah. uh, maybe against those people who talking a uh, bad word of him. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So when he sees his, his body is uh, all filled, yeah. wow. So he should respect that. Tattoos are a form of spiritual expression dating back centuries and today are a way for Marquesans to respect their past and their present. Right here, uh -huh. you can see. Right. So you can see those crosses. This is our, my appartenance of the Catholic Church. Ah, okay, okay. Many people back uh, when there was first contact between Europeans and the people who lived here, the natives, uh, many of the warriors were completely covered in tattoos, face and all, yeah? Of course. Yeah. So you can see an example. Yeah. We have uh, on the ship uh, a seaman, his name is Mahalo. Yeah. He's completely tattooed from the head to the toes. Huh? Right, right. So it means uh, we have a big respect about, about him right. because this is our oldest. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. when we see him, he shared us an energy, you know? Right. So me, I do it, my yeah. friend do it, right. my brother do it, Right. my uncle, sister, everybody yeah. do it. Guys, all right, man. Thanks a lot, brother. You're welcome. For me, tattoos are like marriage. They're commitments to be taken seriously, which is why I'm both tattoo-free and spouse-free for now. Tahuwata was the next Marquesan island for us aboard the Aranui in French Polynesia. Like the islands before it, it too was lovely and yes, you guessed it, remote and rural. Deal with it. We are on the island of uh, Tahuata. Okay. It is uh, one of the smaller islands. Um, it's only about 600 inhabitants here. In the whole island? Mm hmm Wow. The specialty in Tahuata is bone carving. So bone carvings from, uh, you know, animals, yeah. cows or um, sperm whales and things like that. I heard. Not I that heard. they kill purposely, but you know, once they... Once they're dead, mm -hmm. then they use they the bones. They use the bones. Which I heard that back in the day, it was the same thing. The, the way bone carving came into being was humans would die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to take their ancestors, you know, spirit with yes, them, right? Yes, absolutely, yeah. They have beautiful pieces. Okay. Um, it's, you know, very like intricate designs, um, you know, a lot of variety. Um, so it's really the place for bone carving. This is it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We're here. Uh, the ship is here. So there's also a lot of activity, excitement yeah, in the air. It's like cargo day, Christmas day almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can cut the tension with a knife. Everybody's mm -hmm. excited. I'm excited. So I'm going to get a bone carving. Oh, okay. Let's All go right. pick one for All you. Right, let's do it. Wearing human bones around my neck? Hard pass. But animal bone? Why not? This is the ultimate, yeah? That is beautiful, yeah. yeah. So it's from the swordfish. That's from the swordfish? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have like this type. You Look know, at the detail. Have... Crazy little mm -hmm. tiki's. I wonder and... how long it would take. Days, right? At least. Uh, oh, yeah. What kind of tools do they use? Rocks to do this? or? No, they have little machines. Oh, they do mm -hmm. now. Okay. But you have to be very careful not to break the bone or like whatever. I'll be going to be careful not to break this because I don't have this much money, but that is gorgeous. <laughs> That's beautiful. This is a classic tiki. Tiki, yeah. It's the perfect necklace, souvenir right? from the Marquesas. I think I uh, might have to get that one then. Either that or the surfboard. What do you think? Tiki is more Marquesas, I guess. You think so? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe I'll get a gift for my mom. Oh, uh, those are beautiful earrings. Then my mom would mm -hmm. like those? Mom? Yeah? <laughs> Done. I'm doing that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. When Christian missionaries first visited French Polynesia back in the day, they had mixed results. Some became friends who were invited to dinner. Others allegedly became actual dinner. Today, passengers aboard the Aranui feel nothing but welcomed, and the feeling is mutual, as this mix of socially responsible tourism does a lot of good for both traveler and community. 
Ronnie, this church is absolutely beautiful, mm -hmm. but it has a feature like this stained glass, which is so beautiful. It was broken not long ago, and travelers yes. helped replace it, right? Yeah, um, it was broken by um, you know a teenager throwing a stone through it. Yeah. So the whole you know community helped. Aranui also donated some money right. from uh, the you know the Aranui office, but also um, thanks to the travelers coming on yeah. board who participated in. Um, collecting all the funds in order right. for them to replace that. The thing I've noticed when I go to the different communities is no one's asking for money. No yeah. one's aggressively mm -hmm. trying to sell you stuff. Mm. It's really, they're playing music for free. They're like, if you want to donate some money, you mm -hmm. can. Uh, but they don't guilt you into it. It really is an amazing, hospitable culture. Everything is very genuine and everything really comes from the heart. And so whatever they're going to do is because they really want to do it right. and not because they're expecting, you know, some money in return, right. um, which is really nice. It's almost like an age of innocence still. <laughs> My trip to the Marquesas in French Polynesia was winding down. We had now visited all six of the inhabited Marquesas Islands, each one unique in its own right. No way could I call just one my favorite. I truly love them all. Final island, final inhabited island, I should say, of the Marquesas. And, um, you know, naturally you want to sort of like compare the six, but they're really each so unique that it's very, very difficult. Um, I don't have a standout favorite, so I hope I can come back, uh, you know, do a little solo travel, which I love. And um, I can tell you this, I'm way more relaxed at the end of the trip than I was at the beginning. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, the Marquesas. Thanks so much, Aranui. As we prepared to cruise back to Tahiti to fly home, I was not ready to leave. But if I didn't go home, you'd never see this episode, and that would be unacceptable. See how I sacrifice for you? I hope you appreciate it. Plus, there's always hope that I will return. So, as we're getting towards the end of our, you know, Marquesas journey, yeah. um, there is a little tradition I want to share with you. Um, so we have, you know, these beautiful flower hay and lays, mm -hmm. and so we throw those to the ocean okay. when we leave a special place. So, if it returns to the shore, mm -hmm. it will take you back to the islands, if it doesn't, well, maybe not. <laughs> Whoa. I want to point out that those are like all natural. Okay. It's beautiful flowers, leaves from the Marquesas Islands. And you know, this was given to us by the ladies, um, you know, in the islands. Okay. So it's yeah, all so yours. It'll, it'll disintegrate <laughs> in the ocean. So that's the good news. The bad news is if it doesn't come back to shore, I might not be back to the Marquesas. You know. Oh no, I hope <laughs> it comes back to shore. Well, you know, this has been such a great trip. Mm -hmm. I've had such memorable times and i learned so much about not just marquesian culture yeah but uh tahiti french polynesia this whole side mm -hmm. of the world so this will always have a special place i would like to come back so i really hope this comes back to shore because i love the marquesas all right and french polynesia let's I love see what it. happens all right let's see what happens <laughs> ready mm -hmm. one two three Will the flowers make it back to shore? Will Rob come back to the Marquesas? Or end up a bitter old man, venomously hating on raw travel viewers for making him come back home to write scripts and edit? Only time will tell. Final day of sea on the Aranui, and uh, I'm gonna miss it. It's been a great time. I think the most memorable part of this entire trip was getting to know the local Marquesian people, and also on the ship itself, getting to know the crew, uh, getting to know the passengers who were from all over the world. Um, it really felt like a floating United Nations, really. So it's with mixed feelings uh, that I approach the end of the journey. But uh, I know that, you know, the memories, they always last a lifetime. I don't know what the future holds, of course, but if the stars and moon align and the lay comes back to shore, I hope to be back someday. And just remember, if I don't make it back, I'll hate you forever. Not really, that's just some tough love. Now get out there and have your own amazing journeys. One of my favorite things about traveling to French Polynesia is that they don't treat you like a human ATM. They're sharing their culture with you because they want to. 
Now, not coincidentally, on the Aranui, unlike most cruise ships, tipping is 100% optional. Now, on this cruise, the crew's been really good to us, so I want to leave them with a parting gift. This may be a little hard to swallow, but most of the work of putting together this show revolves around me staring at a computer screen. It's hardly the glamorous existence most people imagine. And there's a struggle within me that you may not be able to see. It's a daily battle to maintain some semblance of this quote unquote normal life when all I really want to do is run off and join the circus or a punk rock band or just travel the world helping others out. No camera, no laptop. Ah, but alas, no paycheck. Luckily for me, my needs are quite simple, and I am able to travel and occasionally escape the hamster wheel of life that we call making a living. And I've met some super interesting people along the way who refuse to let society dictate how they live. These folks are living their lives on their own terms that others might call bizarre, offbeat, or different. Let's say no to normal and bring on the weird. It's time for raw travel, and it's time to celebrate those that don't conform. Newsflash, New York City is full of alternative types who don't necessarily conform to mainstream society's idea of normal. Not surprisingly, many are indie artists and entrepreneurs, and they've turned an entire section of Brooklyn into an alternative artistic mecca of sorts. Welcome to Williamsburg, and meet my friend, Laura Rebel Angel, the poster child for non-conforming artistic entrepreneurship. What do you like most about living in, in, in Brooklyn or in Williamsburg specifically? Oh, it's super convenient and I've been living here so long, so many friends here. And the difference about it is, which I'm going to try to show you and take yeah. you to all these places, is that it's all shops and stores or bars or venues that's all friends and it's all friends that are supporting one another. And I, yeah. I just love the creative energy of it, you know what I'm saying? Like, whether it be a tattoo artist? Uh, a designer, uh, a chef, whatever the case may be, or a musician like yourself, mm -hmm. right? And I just love that. I think it's really cool. When Laura's not playing with her band, The Screaming Rebel Angels, she's designing her own line of hair accessories. We stopped by her friend's store, Slap Get back your paper clothes. and your pencil and pay close attention to Kay's recipe for today. It's going to be nutritious and mm -hmm. taking it to Kay's way. Welcome back to Cook with Cade. Today I'm going to make some smoked brisket fajita using some Mo Mountain hot sauce. Stay tuned. Once you have the brisket out of the way, it's smooth sailing from there. I smoked mine, but you can shake it, you can bake it, you can roast it, you can toast it. Do whatever you want with it. As long as you're cooking it, you're fine. All right, now we're going to cook down our vegetables for the fajitas. I'm going to stick a little bit of coconut oil in a wok. I'm going to heat it up. All right, after your oil heats up, you can throw your vegetables in. Right here, I have some some sliced bell pepper, sliced onion, and some minced garlic. You don't want to throw your garlic in right away because it's just going to burn. While my vegetables are sauteing, I'm going to cut up the brisket. My vegetables are about done, so I'm going to add in my garlic. Laura, these are some of your designs? Yeah, this is some of the dog girl. Mo Mountain hot sauce is awesome. And since sour cream goes so well on fajitas, I'm going to mix a little. You're not killing the muskrats. No, for no, this. I'm just awesome. finding, just I like to, to be clear. Just to be clear. Right. Yeah. No, I like no, finding no. a whole bunch of just uh, yeah. random objects and kind of putting them together. So awesome. Oh, look at this. That's Are you paying attention? Like we need some more Mo Mountain. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Let's see. 
It's great. It's nice. Uh, it fits nicely and on short hair as well. My, like, it I does. Can for a funeral or, or, or a wedding. Or wedding or grocery shopping. Mmm, mmm, sausage bun. Spider. Because oh, wow. why not? Now's my Spider. favorite time. So time to eat. Shower a girl sometimes. Not really. You know, I'm happy. I heated up some tortillas in the microwave. <laughs> but if I were a girl, like this, this would be. Give me a few pieces of brisket. Put on some vegetables. Why do you think designers gravitate to Brooklyn? Like Brooklyn just has that independent. Put on some sauce. Spirit. Almost like Manhattan's corporate, Brooklyn's independent. I don't know. Is that correct? That's you know, like, completely 100% accurate. Even non-conformists have to make a living, and Renee and Laura are doing a great job. Non-conformists have been around for centuries in Coney Island at the edge of Brooklyn, New York City. Whoa! That extra Mo Mountain sauce I added made me completely Mo Mountainized! Yes. Since this sauce is made from ghost peppers, as the bottle says, it's kind of hot. If you want to order some for yourself, click the link in the description below. I ain't scared no ghosts. Cause this stuff is good! teach you how to be a sideshow performer too. I mean, can you imagine, like, the first person? What were they thinking when they were swallowing the sword? Like, who this was like, I'm going to do this? Like, who thought of it? <laughs> well, why? I mean, sometimes good money in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, how many people are doing it? Right. Do you remember the first time you swallowed the sword? Did someone instruct you? How did that happen? Okay, man? so we're here, you know, at Coney Island, USA. Right. We've got a sideshow school. Yeah. I was actually a student at the sideshow school. Well, I went on to be the professor of the sideshow school. Oh, so now I run the sideshow school. Okay, so I okay. teach people how to swallow swords and eat fire, having nails into their faces and whatnot. Wow. Who can participate in the sideshow school? Uh, anyone with $1,000. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. So uh, for 1000 bucks, you can learn how to maybe eat, uh, swallow fire, yeah. and now hammer nails into your forehead. Hey, uh, well, into your nose. I'm not sorry, your, not, your, not your forehead. Sorry. Right? <laughs> Don't try that at home. Do not try that at home. That's called uh, a lobotomy. <laughs> It's called stupid, right? That's three thousand uh, dollars, right? <laughs> and uh, or swallow a sword, whatever right. the case may be, whatever act you want to hone, you can do it. Exactly, dude. I may have to do it, man. I need to see if I can scrounge up a thousand bucks. I love it. I'm it's impressed. It's a lot of I'm fun. I'm inspired, man. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Oh, excellent, man. Thanks, dude. <laughs> hey, you got it. All right, man. <laughs> in Coney Island, if you want to fit in, you'd better get busy, not conform. New Orleans, Louisiana has been a draw for traveling musicians for decades. But after Hurricane Katrina, it seems to have especially drawn in nonconformists. Like Jack, who hails from Charleston, South Carolina, and apparently has a thing for the big fish. I mean, the big easy. So climb up to the smoky hole, last the wind not to blow. Hey Jack, the fish on your head, is that a bass or a salmon? I think it's a bass. Where did you get that? I just there's a stuffed fish pillow I got from a thrift store. Oh, you made it? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's I have a so duck cool. one too. Oh, you got a duck one? Yeah. What brings you to New Orleans? Um, the street performance um, yeah. scene that's going on right now. It's a kind of a mecca for travelers, yeah. which um, I consider myself now. As far as like artists and music, why do you think musicians gravitate here? Independent indie musicians. Why are they here? Probably the history of the place. It's so unique. Yeah. Um, especially with the jazz and the blues and everything. The musician lifestyle, generally speaking, could be considered non-conforming. But imagine if you were the only musicians playing punk rock in an entire country. Like the Trinidad and Tobago-based Anti-Everything. So what's it like to be the only punk band for an entire country? That's lonely. <laughs> what's it like, man, when you say, I'm in a punk band, or they say, oh, that's the devil's music. What do they say, man? I don't know much about punk music, but I live a punk lifestyle. Right. Which Right. Makes me feel comfortable playing pop music because it's just as, as real as it could be. We're a very young country. So you know, it's, you shouldn't talk about culture like it's set in stone. Right. And it's not fair to say pop rock isn't Trinidadian culture because right. we don't have a Trinidadian culture where young nations Ellen, still building an identity. Um, so. right. I think that's the part we have to play in the overall landscape of what it is to be a Trinidadian. I love your music, man. I can't wait to hear it live. And, uh, you know, all I got to say is, you know, it might be lonely, but you got to keep up the fight, man. Definitely. <laughs> 
Nonconformists are all over this planet, but what about other planets? Well, on the way to Taos, New Mexico, near the famous Rio Grande Gorge, you might think you've stumbled upon an alien planet. But never fear, my friends. It's just a revolution in sustainable eco-housing called Earthship Biotexture. Earthships. Well, tell me about the name. Like, uh, it sort of makes sense, but... Yeah, we're like a ship that's part of the Earth, and we're riding on planet Earth around the sun, tapping into the Earth temperature, tapping into the potential of the Earth to heat and cool us. It's not that hot of a day outside, but it's very comfortable. We do have these uh, kind of innovative cooling systems in the right. houses that are all, like, natural and don't require any, you know, energy or any power. And, no air conditioning uh, at all? Nope. And in the materials, like, these are obviously uh, bottles, cans, all recyclable stuff. Yep. Is this, what's this other material? Is it concrete? What it's is concrete, that? yeah. It is concrete, yeah, yeah. okay. So, yeah, we use the bottles and cans to, so we don't have to use as much con uh, concrete and cement. And uh, it's really a low-tech way to build. It's easy, it's easy, easy to gather the materials. Uh, some people say with the cans we should be recycling them, but then if you recycle them, you're remanufacturing them and their embodied em energy is even higher. So we just, you know, drink them, put them in the building. And you guys actually have a school, and, yeah. and you oversee the school yourself? Yeah, we have an Earthship Academy. We have 40 students from all over the world that come every month. Okay. Then we, we train them, and we actually we call them the Earthship Army, because after they've been through a month-long right. program here, then we use them all over the world to do all these different projects that we're working on. When I open my utility bill, I think of the Earthships and wonder why we all aren't living this way. So we produce a bunch of food in here, and we, it also helps with the temperature control and Absolutely. oxygen. If we go inside, it's going to be a lot cooler? Yeah, this is what we call the comfort zone of an okay. airship. So okay. this is the interaction zone. Interaction we'll zone. Go into the comfort zone here, and it is oh, yeah. a perfect uh, temperature for a human. Yeah, man, this is much cooler, much yeah. cooler. But this is one of the more basic models. Yeah, this is where our students live in here, and this is a new innovation that we've created here at Airship Biotexture, and it's a cooling tube. So right. when the greenhouse heats up, it draws cool air through the back of the house, which is buried. Okay. And it brings cool air. You can feel it right now. It's awesome. Oh, man. That's and like air conditioning. It, yeah. So the greenhouse draws the air in, and, and it's right. cool air because it's under the earth. Right. So it brings really cool air into your house, and it's just like natural air conditioning. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's like natural, all natural, free air conditioning once yeah. you build it. In most third world places, they don't have much lumber, so we do it. Right. This design is a, a cement and rebar type building. Um, we also do uh, buildings in places like the Philippines where they've had typhoon damage right. and stuff. When to go over. And this roof is a six inch concrete slab. Right. So, like, this is, this is going to go anywhere. So, in the middle of Kansas, yeah. this would work. Like with tornado yeah. country, right? Yeah. Tires packed with dirt are super sturdy and are great material for housing. But not all Earth ships are so bare bones. Some are built for ballers, like me. <laughs> this is luxurious. This, this is, is nice. Top of the line airship right Top here. of the line. Yeah. Wow. Same concept, yeah. just finished a little nicer. Right? Yeah. yeah, same concept, really. Yeah. This house costs the same per square footage as a traditional mid-level house. Oh, Except wow. Except for this house does so much. It right. you know, creates its electricity, it right. harvests water, it grows food, you stable save temperature. You're going to money with this house. Exactly. So they cost the same coming in. But over the long run, you're going to save money. Oh, these are oh, nice. That's Ooh, these are super cool. <laughs> we don't flush with um, drinking water. So what happens is you take a shower, right. the water goes through into this filter digester thing. OK. And then that connects to all the greenhouse and the planters, and it feeds all the plants. Plants, plants. OK. Once it goes through that whole system, it goes through a charcoal and peat moss filter. OK. It drops into a well. And when we flush the toilet, um, we have a pump that brings 1.6 gallons of filtered gray water into the toilet. So we're flushing with water, and that's the third use of water. You guys excuse me, I'm gonna fertilize some flowers here, okay? I'm really digging this style of living, and I'm seriously interested in building one. How long does it take to build a house? Well, a two-bedroom Earthship, we can go anywhere in the world with our Earthship army of trained students, and we can do a house in a month. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. Try to use uh, recycled materials as much as possible. Well, I know I'm a fan, man. I really love it. All right. You know, it's going to be a miracle to keep me from moving here, man. So I'm probably <laughs> going to be your neighbor. All right. I, I love okay. that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Man. 
The alternative lifestyle is a worldwide movement that knows no geographical boundaries. Even in the small country of Laos in Southeast Asia, nonconformists can thrive. Luckily, traveling and not conforming fit together like, like uh, pig waste and fermentation. Be patient. It'll make sense shortly, I promise. We're trying to promote environmental and sustainable design and building. Okay. So we have organic farming, permaculture, okay. natural building, the biogas system. So it's education, agriculture. Yeah, and natural building. So and we try to building. minimize. And then we also create right. local employment. And then travelers can come in and volunteer. Yeah. Yes. So we have the volunteers, but okay. we have our permanent local and oh, staff as excellent. well. Well, let's look around. I want to see uh, some of the rest of the spots here. Let's see. We got a nursery. Here, the guys have a biogas system, which takes human and pig waste, ferments it, and uses the methane gas as fuel for stoves and fertilizer for the gardens. When you go to the bathroom here, you're doing something good yes. for humanity. Absolutely. Awesome. You're helping us cook our food. Wow, I had no idea. I was so <laughs> generous uh, to the planet. Lao kids are clamoring to learn English, so volunteers are welcome to help teach. We have currently about 150 students. 150 students, wow, that want to learn English. And I heard that the Lao kids are really motivated. Like, they're coming in after school on their own to learn English, and they'll do that just because they understand that it's going to give them a leg up. Can some of your volunteers also teach that? Yes. Yep, we, all our teachers are volunteers. Ah, oh, excellent. I grew up on a farm, but not quite like this one. It was so peaceful, I forgot to check Instagram. We don't have Wi-Fi here. No Wi-Fi. Ooh. I don't know. I don't know how much longer I can stay. All right, let's make this quick. All right. Wi-Fi is so not the Zen thing to do in Lyle. Turns out I was not the only one adjusting to this blessed lack of technology. What's your favorite thing about volunteering? The project? Yeah, yeah. The construction, yeah. And then on a rainy day, you can shell peanuts and make peanut butter. Ah, sustainable development. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. I've lived abroad before and I loved it, but it's not always easy saying goodbye to the familiar and embracing another culture. Perhaps there's no better example of a non-conforming lifestyle than that of expats. Like my other friend, John, an American expat living in Budapest, Hungary. Yes, I have exactly three friends. Well, what's your favorite thing about living in Budapest? I know it's a tough uh, one. You know, the bike lanes. Yeah. I, I really love to bike and this, I yeah, saw so your trike, mecca. so you're doing the trike and you can get in the bike lane and just rock and, and roll. Go. Yeah. You could almost go to France here on the Danube River. There's a bike wow. trail that goes up the Danube River. Would you agree that Budapest, compared to a lot of those places further east, seems more westernized in terms yes. of its culture, right? Yes, it, it has become that recently, maybe in the last 10 years or, or before. And so it's, yeah. for the first time traveler, you can still do it. You yeah. can still come to Budapest and not be too um, uh, out of your element. Right, too much culture shock. Yeah. So if, you, if you're like picking a spot to come to first time Eastern Europe, you've done Italy, Budapest. Spain, and <laughs> this is the spot, right? Absolutely. I mean, we've been here not that long already and uh, feel very welcomed is I that how that you way. feel yeah. i feel that way the people are really nice uh and very engaging they want to speak english they want to talk to you they want to know where you're from and i felt welcome what have you learned the most from living abroad because you've lived be also humble. Across the yeah be humble know that that what you've learned when you were brought up is only a small part of life and that other people can give you their small part also right. and then you've got a much larger pie yes expats and long-term travelers are a unique bunch i love meeting them when i travel they seem to teach me so much like shay a u.s traveler and face paint artist we met hanging out in bocas del toro panama and then what brought you to panama my eldest son is mm -hmm. nine and mm -hmm. his roots are panamanian oh and i wanted to find out yeah. where he comes from and like the roots and like what makes him him and I'm, wow. I'm very interested in culture wow and so that was important to me you've done some volunteer work like I mean do you use your painting like you painted the local kids right is that uh, an example of what you've done yeah I do what I can like I do like to just approach people and yeah. Yeah. you know if there's a little kid around yeah. and I'll yeah. like do a little something on me yeah, 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 and yeah. I'll be like 
<laughs> you know what? And, and yeah. I think it's fun just to see, like, yeah. to use your talent or whatever you have. Yeah. I think it's important to share it with others. Right, um, right. Because, I mean, what else are we here for? What else are we here for? Great question. Surely the answer is not just to toll away and scratch out a living. There has to be more, right? Maybe that's the first step to not conforming. Simply questioning conventional wisdom, popular culture, and what we've always been told was the way to live. Hmm. heard that everything in Texas is big. The art, the Longhorns, and at least for a certain travel host, maybe even the egos. While jumping in an RV or a recreational vehicle to road trip through Texas is a no-brainer, this state is big. Where should one go? We chose the Texas Hill Country in the rural areas and small towns surrounding Austin and San Antonio. Hills in Texas? Surprised? Me too. This landscape, combined with an eclectic art scene and unique German heritage, seamlessly coalesce with a more common quest of cattle, country music, and rodeos. The result is a road trip that is both surprising and fulfilling. So hop in as we take an epic RV road trip through Texas Hill Country. Every RV road trip begins with one thing. An RV, of course. We picked up our 24-foot Winnebago Class C Navion at Ronnie Box Kerrville RV in, you guessed it, Kerrville, Texas. Really excited. We got a Winnebago Navion that is going to be our home for the next few days as we make our way through Texas Hill Country. All RVs are not created equal, and the features vary from model to model. What I love about this one, it's got Wi-Fi that's going to roll along with us. And for the kitchen, it's a little bit different. Instead of gas, we have an electric hot plate. Still got that fresh, brand new RV smell. It smells good. I like it. Let's check out the uh, master bedroom here. Looks nice. Let's check out the bathroom. You know I have a fascination with bathrooms. Oh, man, this one's big. I do believe this may be the biggest RV bathroom I've ever had because you can stand up easily. So this is awesome, man. Beautiful, beautiful RV. I can't wait. This is going to be home for the next four days. Um, where am I going to sleep? My tall cameraman gets the master bed. So where does little Rob sleep? Yeah, I just take the ladder and boom, I'm good to go. This looks very comfortable, man. I kind of like it. It reminds me of my first apartment in New York City when I had to climb the ladder and uh, sleep in a bed. I lived there for many years. I can live here for a few nights. And live I did. Very comfortably, I might add. Just down the road from Kerrville is the small town of Ingram, home to something very big, Stonehenge, too. Yes, the original is in the UK. This replica was built in 89. No, not year 89, 1989. It was later relocated to the Hill Country Arts Foundation's grounds, where I met Sarah. Sarah, when were these built? Uh, this was actually built on private property in 1989 by... 1989. Yes, 1989, uh, by a man named Al Shepard okay. with his neighbor, Doug Hill. They got this, uh, this stone and wanted to do something with it, <laughs> and so got the crazy idea to build it on Mr. Shepard's property. I like it. I like it. I've never been to Stonehenge. Have you been to Stonehenge? I haven't. So now if people ask me, though, I can say I've been to Stonehenge. Pause. Two. Two. So this isn't a real-size 
recreation, right? No, it, it's about 60% uh, the height and 90% the width. Oh, okay. But you guys got a lot more going on than just Stonehenge, right? You've got an arts Absolutely. foundation that basically has been around since the 50s, right? Yeah. Since 1959. Yeah, we have an outdoor community theater, an indoor community theater, a visual okay. arts center with yeah. an atelier, and we're also the home of the Texas Arts and Crafts Fair. Wow. Settle on the banks of the famous Guadalupe River. The Hill Country Arts Foundation reflects the array of artistic energy in these parts. And this is, I would imagine, where you do a lot of, do you do musical performances, plays, things like that? Yeah, we do. Uh, we usually do a big kids show out here in the summer okay. and then uh, and then a big musical. Do you have to be able to sing to be in the musical? Oh, no. no oh, really? <laughs> oh, cool. I mean, a few people have to be able to. And I direct nice. a lot of musicals and I can't yeah. sing a lick. I always wanted to get on stage. Is that okay? Please do. Yeah, Thank you. you. Oh, excellent. Wow, this is nice. And the atmosphere is so cool because yeah. you're right here by the river. Yeah. I want to go check out the river. It's the Guadalupe River. Right? Guadalupe River. All right. Is this what defines Texas Hill Country, the uh, river? Uh, it's one of the things that defines the, things. the hill country, yeah. The other ones are hills, I guess, yeah. right? Right? But the other thing I noticed was the artistic energy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this is a really artistic area for such right. a small town. We were actually founded by people from Houston who would summer here and wanted a place to have an artistic community. Oh, wow. And so this was an old roller skating rink, the, the main building. Sitting on several acres, the Hill Country Arts Foundation is a cultural draw for artists and art lovers from across the region. So would you say for this community, for Kerrville and the surrounding area, this is kind of an arts and culture place for people yes. to come, get great um, culture, right? Mm -hmm. Not only see, hey, I can't go to Stonehenge, but right. I can get an idea what it's like, but I can also at the same time like get my feel of arts and culture yeah and for such a small town that no one really even knows about right. we are very artistic well i hope i can come back and check out some of the Please other do. exhibitions you have yeah. thank you so much artistic energy abounds all over texas hill country as does a deep german heritage just 40 or so minutes east of ingram lies charming fredericksburg we stop by the famous Altdorf beer garden to get our fill of wistful american country music and delightful german cuisine yeah, she never love all over me. From my head down to my feet. I haven't had a hot dog in years, but we're in Fredericksburg and it has a rich German heritage and we're at Aldorf's beer garden. And so it seemed like the right thing to do. So this is a German hot dog. Let's go, man. I haven't done this in years. I need strong mm. Oh, man. I don't know what I've been missing. <laughs> That's a good hot dog. I can't shake her milk more. Now, if you're a country music fan, you may have heard of Luckenbach, just a short drive from Fredericksburg. Can't do a road trip through this part of Texas without stopping in Luckenbach, made famous by that Willie Nelson song. And they say it's got a population of just three people. I guess the three locals were busy because sadly the kissing booth was empty. But at least this guy was available for a selfie. Now if you're a country music fan, you may have heard of Luckenbach, just a short drive from Fredericksburg. Can't do a road trip through this part of Texas if you ask without me, stopping Texas in Lucanbach. Made famous by that Willie Nelson music. song. They're just and they say it's got a population. What be the three so RV and motorhome I guess the three the variety of RVs busy parts. because sadly or is a kissing rod was from Longhorn. But at least this guy was, was available for a selfie. Now if you're a country music fan, you may have heard of Lucanbach. Just a short drive from Fredericksburg. Can't do a road trip through this part of Texas without stopping in Lucanbach. Made famous by that Willie Nelson song. Just and they say it's got a population of you know, just a crazy RV here out there. And I do see some really, really nice RVs. We cater to pretty much everybody. We want everybody to be able to come out and have a good time. You know what I like about it is it's kind of out here. It's very quiet and peaceful. So it it's is. out in the country. You got the Longhorns in the background. You got the lake in the background. Absolutely. That, that's part of the appeal as well, right? And, and we bought enough property to keep anybody from being able to encroach around us, being able to move in on us and, and yeah. eliminate our, our peace and tranquility here. Yeah, that's important in Texas, Absolutely. right? Why do you think RVing is so popular? I think people want to get away from the daily grind. They just want to get somewhere, decompress, and unwind. Um, you know, 
get away from the hustle and bustle, get away from the day-to-day, the -day. don't want to have to mow the grass, they don't want to have to do a whole lot of anything, but relax and enjoy themselves. Rob has a great first name and an excellent RV resort, but he also has a herd of iconic and somewhat sinister looking Longhorn steers. Now, if you don't know what a steer is, well, Google it, Greenhorns. These Longhorns are huge, man. Yeah, they get pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, I'm a little nervous when they're behind me, so I'm going to just look behind just because they're eating, right? Yeah, and I don't trust them a whole lot anyway, so. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Believe it or not, these Mediterranean miniature donkeys help keep coyotes at bay, proving yet again that looks can be misleading. With the Longhorns, they use it as protection or just to, to bump stuff out of the way or what? They'll move stuff out of the way. They'll use it to protect themselves, but okay. the, they don't, you know, that's that's just what they're born with. And some of them some of them are bred to have longer horns than others. You can see Big Red, he's he's pretty good size. He's about 108 inches, 108 to 110 inches. Now, for everybody that doesn't know, these are steers, so they're not correct. bulls, right? That's correct. So I got to tell you something, seeing these things up in personal, <laughs> you see them on TV, but seeing them up in personal uh, while they're eating just a few feet away, and they're sneaking up behind you. You, you. There's a lot of respect here. You Let have, me just you say have that. to have a lot of respect for them because they can they can hurt you, Ooh. mostly unintentionally. But, yeah. But yeah. they can they can get after you. Wow. So. Never fear exploring, my friends. But unless you're with Rob from the Longhorn RV Resort, maybe you should steer clear of the Longhorns just in case. Elgin, Texas is about 45 minutes east of Austin, and since 1989, it's been home to the Down Home Ranch, a community-based working ranch whose mission is to empower the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. What's great about the Down Home Ranch is they'll welcome volunteers of all stripes, especially RV users who will come here, hook up to their water and electricity. They have space enough for eight of them. And they'll volunteer and also go around and see the surrounding area of Elgin and other spots. The residents of Down Home Ranch are aptly called ranchers. And Craig Russell is the executive director. Craig, tell me a little bit about the purpose of Down Home Ranch. So Down Home Ranch is a community of opportunity. Right. It's a working farm and ranch for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Okay. We have a residential program. We have people that live here. As a working farm and ranch, we have all kinds of different areas. We have cattle. We have horticulture. Uh, we have enterprise, uh, different ways that we generate income. Right. It provides jobs for people with intellectual developmental disabilities. This greenhouse that we're in is part of the enterprise, which means part of the way that you guys are sustaining yourself, one of the revenue streams, right? Correct. Yeah. So right now this is uh, spring color. Okay. So it's plants that we're growing that'll be sold and we'll grow anywhere from 10 to 12,000 poinsettias. Wow. And then we'll sell those to churches, fundraisers, the local grocery chain. And then you have uh, volunteers and staff as well, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, we have about 47 staff that work here. Okay. And volunteers are um, our greatest asset. Yeah. You see the things we're doing, and so managing 410 acres of property, we, we couldn't do it without our volunteers. Ranching is not the only way residents can contribute. The ranch also acquired a laser engraver that allows the more artistic ranchers to create and sell their artwork, earning the ranch another revenue stream and themselves an income. Ranchers like the very talented Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hiya. How you doing? Doing good. Excellent. What are you drawing here? Well, I'm doing this for my boyfriend. Really? Okay. And now you're making him a gift? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Are we going to give it away if we talk about it here? Is Why he watching? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By then, he'll have it, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, this looks like something that would be a great gift for someone for oh, yeah. Valentine's or just any romantic oh, occasion. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. For anniversaries. Yeah. So this is what you like to do here at yes. the ranch, yeah? I've been an artist since I was 10 years old. Oh, no kidding. Yes. Oh, wow. Because wow. art is my passion. Well, I got to tell you, you got some talent. It's not only your passion, it's your talent as definitely. well. Definitely. You definitely got some talent. Every time I feel like, like I'm down in the dumps, yeah. I just take out my art and just focus on that instead of, of the anger. Right, right, right. Instead of the negativity, you can yeah. turn it into something positive. Yeah. John is another rancher here. He prefers working with animals and his fellow ranchers. John, what's this guy's name? That one's name is Yo-Yo. Yo-Yo, all right. I can see Yo-Yo can reach pretty far there on <laughs> the green grass, right? Yes, stick this big old head out the fence. What's your favorite part about being uh, on the down-home ranch? Is it uh, working with animals or? 
I like working with animals. I like uh, helping people out with their, if anybody has any problems, I like to help it, help yeah. them out with their problems. Mm -hmm. And then the little golf carts here, I see that you, you actually are licensed to drive those. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. Oh, that, makes uh -huh. it, that makes it handy when you have a ranch. Because see, if you're living in the village area, yeah. it's kind of like a long way to walk to get to your work uh, area. Right, right. So you're able to do that, and you give somebody a ride every now and then, too, right? Exactly. Those right. that need a ride, I give them a ride. You're going to give me a ride later on, maybe, because I'm getting tired. You Is bet. that okay? Yeah. You bet. Oh, I love it. I love it, man. Riding with John in his golf cart and just getting to know the ranchers and big-hearted staff and volunteers at Down Home Ranch was a definite highlight of this Greenhorn's RV road trip. No RV road trip through the Texas Hill Country would be complete without a good old-fashioned rodeo, replete with real-life cowboys. The small community of Bull Verde, just north of San Antonio, is home to the Tejas Rodeo Company. It's set among a vintage western backdrop and run by former professional rodeo cowboy, Yancey James. Yancey, I wore my uh, fancy uh, rodeo outfit. Is this uh, how a rodeo guy? Well, you know, not, not typically, but we'll, we, can do, we can make do today here, here at Tejas Rodeo, you know. I think it's more like what you got on. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the attire, you know, and it, it comes from a history of the sport and, and being amongst it. Long sleeve shirt, cowboy boots, and pants, you know, because you... You get out there, you get dirty, it's yeah. it's it's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no know, matter how hot the weather keeps you from getting a farmer stand. You can get in a farmer stand. Yeah. yeah. And, that. <laughs> and you were a professional performer, cowboy? Or? Yeah, yeah, a professional rodeo cowboy for several years. Okay. I, I sure was. It was yeah. my way of life. Still is my way of life. I just don't compete as a professional anymore. Now we we run this place, Teos Rodeo, and kind of give people a taste. I I can give people a taste of what I experienced. You right. know, and bring it here to the hill country and show them a real rodeo. Well, you know, the thing that fascinated me uh, when I was growing up, in particular, still does to this day, because I've seen these bulls up close and personal, is the bull ride. Yeah. That takes some guts. Did you do that? Was that I, your I did. I did. It was... Yeah? I look back now, I have no idea what I was thinking. But, yeah. <laughs> but that was my profession. That was my... If there was a claim to fame in my life or whatsoever, that would have been it. I'm wondering if today, if you would maybe show me a little bit of the cowboy lifestyle, maybe teach me how to rope. Um, Get me on a bull. Hey, what I do you tell you say? what, you're making it too easy. We're, we're always open for stuff like that, and we can definitely yeah. get you suited up. And, and yeah. let's see if we can rope something. All right, and If all that right. doesn't work, let's see if we can not see if you can ride a bull, man. There we go. Let's start off the easy stuff, roping. Roping. We'll do it. All let's right, do yes. it. What Yancey didn't know is that I was an old hand at roping, but sadly, my Argentine gaucho days were a distant memory by now. Roping has a practical application as a way for cowboys to catch and treat sick cattle on the open range. But my target would be a stationary dummy. Yes, I know, just like me. You have two different types. You have the, the arena roping, the stuff that's done at the rodeo, and then the guys in the pasture. Of course, in the arena, you know, we're adding some time to it, some speed to it. We're, we're making it challenging. Right. Now, I don't know if I told you this or not, but in Argentina, I have roped a bull. Uh, by accident, pretty much. Uh, so, I don't know, man. I think I'm going to be pretty good, but let me get a refresher course. Let's, let's get a refresher yeah, course. Yeah, All right, yeah. I'm going to step back. I don't want right. to hit you. All right. The goal is is, is you want to make sure your loop is open. See, okay. I can see you through it. Okay. Right? You know, and then stick it on the right horn. Left horn, pull your okay. spray. Okay, I was trying to pay attention. Right. Let's see here. You get all your rules and techniques. <laughs> Man, all right. all right. Okay, I'm going to do it all for you right okay. now. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Right. You got the feel? Uh-huh. Are you looking at the right horn? Oh, uh, yeah, I am now. Okay, I'm going to step out. It's okay. all yours. Take okay. a couple swings okay. and then okay. All right, you got it. There you go. Uh, oh, man. Not bad, hey. All right. Not bad. not bad. You kept it open. You didn't roll it around. Okay. You tell me First how bad thing I'm is, doing. is in front of your face. Like okay. That. There you go. We'll take it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I got to get focused hey, here. you're not wadding it up, so you're looking good. <laughs> right in. All right. Yeah. Oh, oh. man. Hey, we're, we're there. We can take that. Good enough, man. Is that good? Enough, good? All right, man. Hey, that's good pretty morning. good, man. Thank that you. works. I've been talking a lot of bull, but now it's time to ride one. Sort of. Yancey, all right, it's not a live bull, but... Yeah, it's close enough. <laughs> we, we, we probably better start here first, is, what, is my recommendation. All right, yeah. all right. Am I supposed to do like this? Yeah, yeah well, you want to you wanna not have a whole lot of movement. Oh, okay, It's okay. going to be a balancing act. Oh, it you is? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're going to need that. Okay. You know, and the more you move your arm, 
other okay. direction to twist your body off, which is going to get you bucked off. Okay. That bag doesn't look too soft to me, man. No, yeah, well, it never is when you get bucked off. Uh, the goal is don't get bucked off. All right, all right, don't that's get bucked off. And that's softer than the ground, for that's sure. That's true. Okay, that's all right, true. All right. <laughs> all right, let's do this. <laughs> I think I threw my back out again. Okay, while it's apparent that I'm no cowboy, I sincerely enjoyed my time at Tejas Rodeo and my RV road trip through Texas Hill Country. And that, my friends, is no bull. To me, Texas is super RV friendly. It's got really good highways. It's got, obviously, lots of land. It's a huge land mass. And you begin to notice, like, there's a lot of people RVing in Texas. This is my first time RVing in Texas, but I hope it's not going to be my last because I want to come back and just do some more road tripping, uh, maybe back to this area, but also some of the other areas I've never even been to. Last night we finished up our shoot kind of late and we did not have reservations at an RV park because I was kind of unsure where we were going to be the next day. But it's no problem when you're in an RV like this one. Uh, everything is self-contained. So we were able to do boondocking and that's the first time I was able to do that. And boondocking just means that you're at a place where you don't hook up to electricity or water. You're using the resources from the RV itself. And uh, it gives you a lot of freedom. It means you can park anywhere. In our case, we're here at someone's farm, and uh, they were kind enough to say, hey, just park it out there. And uh, I have to be honest with you, I slept like a baby. So <laughs> I'll probably be boondocking again soon. Believe it or not, actual travel is an all too small part of producing this show. So when the folks from the hybrid passenger and cargo ship, the Aranui, invited me on board a journey in the South Pacific, I put them off. I didn't think I could afford to be away from my business in the US that long. But then I realized time is our most precious commodity and every day I have less left than the day before. That's why I decided to spend some time in French Polynesia, island hopping some of the most secluded and remote islands in the world, the Marquesas. While I live in New York City and can go to the corner store for most items, the Marquesas must wait and get their needed supplies from a shipment from the Aranui. I have stuff, but little time, and they have lots of time, but little stuff. We needed to meet. I can't afford to waste any more time, and you can't either. So what's your dream trip? Perhaps it's this one. Come with us. It's time to go island hopping in the Marquesas on Raw Travel. We'd been traveling on the Aranui to the remote Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia for a few days and had some tremendous experiences on the itinerary. But when we hopped over to the island of Hiva Oa, I got the hankering to go rogue and forge my own path. Luckily, Ronnie, my friend from the Aranui, knew someone who knew someone on Hiva Oa who would rent us their truck for the day. They didn't even ask for my driving record. Oh well, what they don't know won't hurt them now. So where, where are we headed, Ronnie? So we're heading to the village of Atuona, which okay. is the main village on the island of Hiva Oa. We can also find their shagrels, um, cultural center. So Jacques Brel was a Belgian singer. Marquesians loved, loved him. Right. So basically, I'm going to tell him my name is Robert Brel, great grandson of. <laughs> See what happens. They might ask you to sing. <laughs> Not a bad thing. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Enough daydreaming. Focus, Rob. 30 kilometers an hour. I'm speeding already. Okay. Oops, sorry. Damn, these brains are sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> wow, beautiful. What a view. It's so different when you have your own wheels. 
I mean, I love not having to, like, do the thinking sometimes, but also after you've done that for a few days, it's good to, like, be on your own and, and explore. It feels more adventurous a little bit. We were on our way to visit some of the island's more remote ruins and petroglyphs. If you want to get away, this is the place. Ronnie, this is a surreal spot. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's so calm. We have the high cliffs behind us. We have the rock formations. We're staying off the holy area there, the spiritual area, like the platform. We're in the village of Taua, Taua. Uh, okay. which, you know, was one of the most important ones in the past. They were so in touch they were, with nature. Yeah, they were, they one were with living nature. like with, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and here, you're surrounded by the whole, you know, the mountain ranch. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you're in this, you know, little bubble. <laughs> and you'll notice when we drive around, it's, it's, it's pretty clean. Yeah. They're very respectful of their islands. They're very respectful of what they have and what they've been given. Right. And they don't take it for granted. Banyan trees look great for climbing, but it's not a good idea. These large trees are old, but most importantly, sacred. I can imagine like the little kids playing in the banyan tree. <laughs> or would they play in the banyan tree? Because it's kind of no, holy, so no. Yeah, it's sacred. Sacred. You go to so many ruins and there's like people, officials, mm -hmm. trampled mm -hmm. to death by tourists. And here you come, and we're the only people here. I know, it's a luxury. It is. I mean, there's not, I don't know. I, I haven't been to many places like this in the world. Mm. This is amazing. As remote as Hiva Oa is, folks from France or Belgium know it well. The Belgian singer Jacques Brel and the French painter Paul Gauguin lived part of their lives here and are both buried here. This is the town cemetery, right? Yes, it's, a, it's the yeah. small uh, cemetery of, of Atua now. Right. Um, so we have Jacques Brel's grave over there, and yeah. we have Paul Gauguin's grave a little further up with a beautiful statue uh, that is called Oviri, which is one of his creations. And people, travelers, come far and wide for this, not oh, just yes, French, all absolutely. over the world. Belgium, all French, mm -hmm. all over. They come here to give, you know, um, tribute to those, those artists. If you say Jacques Brel to any Marquesian, they just adore him. Right. You know, he had a plane, um, he would, you know, deliver mail, he'd do medical emergencies, he'd take, you know, kids for rides. Right. Um, so he was really a good, good person. And he came to the Marquesas Islands to really escape, um, you know, celebrity and fame. He came to the island of Hivaoa with his um, sailboat and went to the post office and said, oh, you must have mail for me. Uh, my name is Jacques Brel. And the postman said, who? So he's like, okay, I'm gonna love this place. Yeah. <laughs> it's like me, when I go somewhere, I'm like, I'm Robert Rose. And if they say, who? I'm like, <laughs> Which means I'm good in 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of the world. Okay, maybe make that 99.999% of the world. Paul Gauguin, um, it's a little more controversial, right. but you know, um, his art has been, you know, widely recognized as, and, and this, his years here were, you know, among the best. Jacques Brel is still beloved on the island. Paul Gauguin, not so much. Note to self, behave, at least while in the Marquesas. Tiki's represent ancestor spirits and most have a stern expression. But Hiva Oa has one of the few that's turned that frown upside down. He's not easy to find, but Ronnie and I found it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We made it. <laughs> we found it. It wasn't easy. So they, they call this a smiling tiki. Obviously, he's smiling, but that's an unusual thing in the market. It's very unusual. And so um, from what the locals are saying, it's actually the only smiling tiki in all of the Marquesas. Hard to find, but... Yeah, very hard to find. It's right kind of deep in here. There's not a lot of signage. And it's just like a road that goes to a dirt road that goes to a path. And we almost mm -hmm. missed it. We were giving up, right? We were giving up. And I don't know. I think it was totally worth it. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah? I love it. <laughs> I'm happy. So smile. Smile. The village of Pua Mo is also on the island of Hiva Oa, which is in the Marquesas Islands, which is in French Polynesia, which is in the South Pacific Ocean. So yeah, it's isolated. Getting supplies and passengers in and out is not an easy proposition. So we are um, in Puamo, which is another village on the island of Hiva Oa. Okay. Um, it's a little isolated, okay. and so they do get their own little dock, and we deliver provisions, you know, right here. I mean, you've seen it's a very, very difficult yeah. landing. I was in your hands. I was just like jelly when they pulled me up. I'm like, 
Yeah. Don't let me fall. I was literally, <laughs> and they took really good care of everybody. You they guys do. are good. It I takes, mean, they know you what know, like doing. these really strong Polynesians to like get you out of this boat. And they take care of you. They're like, we're not going to let you fall. Mm -hmm. We'll go down, but you're not going down. I love it. So here we're going to see um, the giant tikis of Puamo um, on one of the, uh, you know, archaeological sites that can be found on the island. And they call them the giant tikis, so they must be really big, yeah? They are very tall, yes. Okay, no smiling tikis, though. No smiling tikis. Okay, <laughs> like a typical tiki. All right, it's a little bit of a hike. You ready? Let's go. All right, let's do it. The tikis of Puamo are the largest in all of the Marquesas. John is one of the guides with the Aranui, and like much of the crew, he's also a local Marquesan. So when it's time to talk tikis, John knows his stuff. This site well, is Meai Iipona, okay. which means the nut of power. The nut of power. Okay. Yes. These tikis themselves, the, you guys call them the, uh, the, the giant tikis, right? Because yes. are they bigger than the average tiki? These are the biggest tikis that we can find in the Marquesas. What's the significance of this guy? He looks like he's kind of blood red. Yeah. Well, actually, he's a very important tiki to the site because he's built in um, red volcanic tuff. His name is Takai. Okay. He was a great chief of this um, of this tribe, and Takai, which means red with rage. Red with rage. So yeah. you don't want to cross him. Don't want to mess up with him. Each tiki represents an important ancestral leader who, in death, becomes like a god. After an important person passes away, a chief, a priest, or a yeah. warrior, they would build a tiki to represent that person, and then the spirit of that person will go into the tiki and will live throughout the tiki and become a god. There were great um, women um, who were chiefs at that time, too. Okay. And they can have, like, up to 30, 40, well, one main husband and 30, 40 sub-husbands, sub -husband. secondary husbands. Just... Yes because there were more men than women at that time. We tried to protect them and preserve them as much as possible. So we ask on the people today to not touch the tikis, but they can come and take pictures and enjoy the archeological site here. Really? Hmm. Well, this little guy's a local, so I guess it's all good. The island of Fata Hiva is the southernmost of the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia. It's also the most isolated of all the inhabited Marquesas Islands. After the Aranui anchored in the bay, Ronnie wanted to show us the island's two main communities of Amoa and Hanavabe. The two villages are connected by a, you know, a small road okay. that you can hike right. or you can go by car. Um, the specialty in Fatihiva is the tapa making, okay. which is, uh, you know, bark from the tree okay. that they use as a piece of cloth. Fatihiva is so remote that it has no airport, so it's dependent on the Aranui for supplies and the ship's passengers who buy handmade souvenirs, providing the locals a much-needed revenue stream. And only 700 people on the whole island, I mean... 700, yes. Talk about knowing your neighbors and being dependent on your neighbors and being dependent on the Aranui on to the, come yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a gorgeous island. Yeah. One of my favorites, I have to say. Yeah. Um, but it's beautiful, and uh, we're going to discover that today. Really friendly people, I bet. Absolutely, I'm yeah. betting. All right, cool. I can't wait. This small, tight-knit community prides itself on top of making a type of paper made from bark that has multiple uses. This is called tapa. Yes, tapa. Tapa, okay, and it's taking tree bark uh, and turning it into more like a paper material that they used to wear. Did they used to wear as clothes? Is that the deal? Exactly, well, mainly during ceremonies. Okay. Fatuhiva is the one that's been doing this for, for centuries, even after the arrival of the Europeans. Oh, wow. Well, it depends on the type of tree you use. Okay. So the different bark. Here, I think we're using mulberry paper. Okay. And that will give a white tapa. Here, she stripped off the bark. Uh-huh. And then she's going to separate the outer layer from the inner layer okay. that she's going to use then and then tap on it to make the tapa. Okay. Now she's going to use the ridge side right here. So tapping on it. And you can see it stretching. Yeah, it is. It's getting bigger. It's flattening it out. Top of making is not for the impatient. Luckily, in these parts, time moves at a much slower pace. Okay, okay. All right. Wow. 
Yeah, That's it's here. beautiful. Wow, it's amazing. It doesn't even resemble what we first saw. Yep, and then she's going to open it up okay. and stretch it out and show you how large it is now, how okay. wide it is from the beginning. Wow, check that out. She will draw on it after okay. when it's ready okay. using ink. Okay. So um, they use um, fabric paint, uh -huh. as you can see right there, mm. and a piece of um, this that comes from the coconut leaf, huh? Oh, wow. All right. And she ties her hair at the end of it. At the tip, it's hair. Oh, really? And she draws on the top of Wow. With the hair? Yes. Whoa. There's the finished product. It's so beautiful and intricate. If I buy one of those and put it on my wall, it has way more meaning. Yes. Knowing how much work went into mm -hmm. it. It's not just the actual painting. It's actually making the yeah. canvas. Uh-huh. From what's around us. All natural. Yeah, all natural. Wow. I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. Fata Hiva residents are also known for making umu hay, a kind of perfume or cologne slash aphrodisiac. I call it umu hey hey. The umu hey. Umu hey. Yes. Okay. And uh, what is that exactly? <laughs> well, actually, it's a flower bouquet, okay. but it's aphrodisiac. Oh, okay. It's an aphrodisiac flower bouquet that the women make for their husbands. Mm. And all women that makes a perfect umuhei keeps her husband forever. Ah. Yes. Okay, so umuhei skills are very important to a happy home life. Yes. Also an aphrodisiac for ladies when yes. the guy is wearing uh -huh. it. So it goes both ways. Goes both ways. All right. <laughs> There you go, you have your umu hay. Oh, umu uh, hay, there that. we go, beautiful. Oh, thank you. And go ahead now, you have to smell it. The whole oh, thing. It smells really good. Yes. All of that mixed together, it's the smell of the islands concentrated, mm -hmm. yes, really. It is. Oh, it's like a natural aphrodisiac. Umu hay hey worked. I was falling in love with the more cases. Our island hopping cruise aboard the Aranui to the island of Fatuhiva in the Marquesas was going splendidly. In remote Fatuhiva, there are two main villages on the same coast. The Aranui dropped us off on the Moa side, where Ronnie had arranged for a local driver to take us overland to the other coastal village of Hanavave. There, we'd catch up with the ship's crew while they dropped off supplies. This was no mere convenience. The multi-hour drive was simply spectacular. Hanavave lies in what is today called the Bay of Virgins, but the natives had originally named it after the imposing rock overlooking the village. This being a family show, I won't get into the details. We are in the Bay of the Virgins. Oh, okay. Um, which is one of the most spectacular bay you can find in the islands of Tahiti. I agree, I agree. Just the view is incredible. And you had told me that the Bay of the Virgins at one time was called the Bay of something else based yes. on these points right here and over there and what they look like. Who changed them? The Catholic Church came in? So, um, originally, yeah, it was indeed named another bay. Um, and the missionaries came and changed the name because it, um, they thought it was too... Uh, Primitive. Sexual and primitive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, too hard for them to listen to those words. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it became the Bay of the Virgins. Okay. The opposite. <laughs> yeah, and you can feel the mana, the kindness of people. You know, it's just very genuine here. Yeah. The mana meaning power, right? The, that life force. You know, the, the like force. that beautiful energy. Yeah. I like it. Can we explore around a little bit more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Despite their isolation, the Marquesas Islands I'd visited so far seemed to want for nothing. I wondered how they make a living. One answer, coconut oil. Ronnie, is this mm -hmm. coconut good to eat? No, so this one you wouldn't eat. Okay. That's what we call copra. Okay. So copra is basically, you know, um, dry coconut. They make the copra here, but then yeah. it is shipped to Tahiti, okay. to the old factory, uh, and okay. there they will process the copra. So you need a lot of sun. That's why you can see like this, this big platform. Right, right. It is our like one of the big industries it in is. the islands, yeah. So it's basically coconut oil, pre-coconut oil. It's yeah. pre-coconut oil, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've seen this kind of setup for like coffee, cocoa, yeah. beans, stuff like that. Uh, but I've never seen it for coconut. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. 
Roughly translated, mana means sacred energy, and I was feeling it. Island hopping on the Aranui through the Marquesas may have just been the best decision I'd made in a long time. I don't know what it is about Fatahiva, but I think the landscapes, the people, the remoteness, those would be the three things that I would uh, sum up to say why I like it so much. I love connecting with locals, but I also enjoy meeting fellow travelers from all over the world, like Adrian and Fanny. This young French couple is traveling the world, but this isn't self-indulgence. Their purpose is to study climate change and help us all do something about it. We are going to make a study about climate change on the island of Wapu that are developing solutions right. to adapt to climate change and protect the environment. Yes. The question is now, what do we do about it? How are people uh, improvising solutions, yes? Yes, and what we are studying here exactly is about marine protected areas right. uh, ruled by children. Children are managing the marine protected area. So children are actually involved in this? Yes. Whatever is going to happen could happen in the next few decades. A exactly. And uh, the children are the people who suffer if we do nothing. Most. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Different climates and yeah. different different cultures also to discover and yeah. be in inspired. What we want to show, what we want to do, is to show that solutions are exist exist yeah. and that we can change uh, the the history. <laughs> absolutely, 100%. Changing history. Together we do have the power. So sign me up. How do you plan your RV camping trips? Well, we visited all of the campgrounds in the state of Louisiana, and you can find them all in our directory right now. You can also find repair shops, dealerships, manufacturers, and more. Check it out at rvworldnetwork.com.